Hi, Tony. Hi, Adrian. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Yeah. Um, is this a t-shirt that you have? Yes, it that, is. Of one of your works? That looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> Disco isn't dead. It's not dead, thanks to you in part. <laughs> so I was really curious, Tony, about this new body of work. This was, is this all new? It is all new. I can't say that they were not, in some cases, things that I was, you know, thinking about. But, um, and this configuration is probably, I don't think it would have happened this way under other circumstances. But yeah, it's all new. They're all short, though, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you don't have to get too involved. It, it's, you know, kind of two-way street in a way, because on the one hand, the pieces are short, and that's, you know, really a good thing in the sense that, at least for me, I can, you know, sort of try things out. You know, um, I have a feeling that some of these may eventually become longer pieces, maybe with different soundtracks, because I've been doing things like that lately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of increasing the iterations, you know, um, although, you know, that, that sort of thing has happened in the past. But anyway, you know, the mandate was very, very clear, um, two and a half minutes. And so some people had consumed the time in different ways, like taking, you know, a feature length project and dividing it over 30 days. Um, some people had made, you know, one piece per day or, you know, or had done some other, you know, intervention. And I thought, well, maybe a week at a time would be nice. And then I'll get to do four pieces and not one piece. And, so tell yeah. me, just to back up a little bit, what was the invitation that came to you? So they asked you to do what? Yeah, they, it wasn't, you know, super specific. The major th thing that I remember is that the time, you know, element mm -hmm. was that they only had, I believe at, at first it was, I can't remember, two minutes at first. And then just before I started producing them, they said, oh, you can have two minutes and 30 seconds. And then they have another 30 seconds of um, material, you know, contextualizing the project and sponsors and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, at first I was saying, whoa, two minutes, you know, how many of these could, should, would I produce? And then I, I thought, well, it might be interesting not to do, um, you know, all subsets of the same larger piece, but almost a way to take some themes that I've been thinking about mm -hmm. and present, you know, kind of short works related to those, those, those pieces. And so it was actually fairly easy to choose once I had kind of made up, you know, in my mind conceptually, I think I'll do one project per week, you know, mm -hmm. where people would have at least in theory, the chance to see the piece multiple times, as opposed to it being like one every day and then they're kind of, well, not gone, because I think they do archive the pieces, um, or could, but um, I kind of like the idea of a kind of dispersed um, presentation. I guess I did that on my last commission, too, where mm -hmm. it was like originally conceived as a longer project, and I had very, very specific ideas about how the soundtrack would operate, but then, you know, when presented with um, this idea of maybe doing something episodic, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to do these quick and dirty, not, you know, I can't even do the sound edit that I would like to do for these, but I could present something. And I like the idea of it being um, episodic as opposed to, you know, one thing. Um, I think that that methodology kind of, it, it was, I think it made it easier for me anyway to to produce in the time constraints. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the case of the pieces I did for the shed um, over the summer, um, mm -hmm. I've returned to that visual material. And now I've really done the sort of soundtrack in the complexity that I originally wanted to do it. But, you know, it's it's kind of for me, it's often about getting things done in the constraints and the idea of like, yeah. I can do these short pieces. Maybe they won't say everything I have to say about the text, you know, in, in question, but mm -hmm. it'll, you know, kind of get things out there, 
and put things on the table. And I was especially, you know, thinking it might be interesting to work with the large scale LED presentation. I mean, it's a really large scale display that you're um, working with this time. So what was that like to kind of create something on that scale? I think for me, you know, it was, it's something I've been thinking about in one way or another for a very long time. Like how would these um, hold up in a kind of um, public architectural scale? Um, and it was one of those things where it was like, oh, well, here's an opportunity to do something, you know, at that scale. I think it did have some influence over the way that I approached the pieces um, formally because you know, it was kind of like, oh yeah, these are short. Keep keep in mind, these are short. Now, I suppose I could have made them, you know, a series or subdivisions, you know, using the same text or text. But for whatever reason, I thought, hmm, here here's some ideas that I have, and you know, they sort of, at least for me, trace out a kind of imaginary trajectory, and. I thought that might be a more interesting thing to do. Maybe because I'd just done a piece where all the material came from the same text and it was like subdivided into chapters or episodes. And I thought, okay, I'd like to do something maybe a little broader. And the context seemed, at least in my mind, to accommodate that, that not everything had to be um, from the same source mm -hmm. or explicitly linked. Although I must admit, I did take the opportunity to build in what I felt were some links between the pieces. Mm. Um, I'm curious, I want you to talk about that too, but you can, you can finish the first question. <laughs> uh, it, it had an effect, but it was interesting to think about. Like, I think the greatest effect that it had, honestly, for me was it moved me towards the idea of coding things because mm. my, my texts usually are, excerpts but you know reasonably um you could say reasonably coherent fragments even when you know i edit things together from different places in the text you know i usually mark those you know by various devices um but in this case i really you know how should i put it, it it's kind of a little it, it was almost as though i knew that these things would be really large and I knew that they would, you know, be impactful in a particular way. And it actually opened me up to doing something that I'd been thinking about doing for a very long time, but just hadn't gotten around to it. You know how that is. You, it's like, you. is this the right place to make that change? Um, or how, how would that work? And I thought maybe the scale would, you know, be a reason almost like, I, I had the feeling initially, wouldn't it be interesting? And maybe I thought about, you know, various um, questions of what is made public by whom and what kind of space. And it almost automatically made me think about the possibility of doing something in public that is coded as mm -hmm. opposed to um, something that just presents itself in a particular way. And it was something, you know, it's like a technique I've used um, in titling pieces mm -hmm. um, or um, file names for, for years. Um, I was talking to um, Peter Saville earlier and he brought up the fact that it seemed, there's something that seems hip hop about, you know, dropping vowels and only cos consonants or that sort of thing. So that's, you know, a possible reference, mm -hmm. um, but it also is, you know, a technique I've probably been using for Eh, almost two decades for yeah. title for things. Right. And, you know, those are kind of like just, I, I always feel like they're kind of ways of, um, especially if you say, want to say a lot of compressing the language, you know, say if you're doing a, you know, a title or something. And I thought, what would it be like to have a piece where it was mostly that kind of, you know, coding and abbreviation? Mm. And um, yeah, it sort of got me into thinking about um, non-majority cultures and subcultures publicly presenting in kind of coded ways, you know, or in non, um, it's not like they're illegible, but they're non, um, I don't know, you could say non-traditional or non, um, 
straightforward modalities, almost as though you have to work in order to you know, get some understanding of it, but it's not impossible. And that's kind of interesting too. You know, um, one of the natural questions is why is one different? And the one is different in some ways because the text and the language um, didn't, how should I put it? It didn't really operate the same way as the others. And I, I didn't quite know why at the very beginning, but I think it's something about the language that when you start um, abstracting things, it becomes harder to read than some of the other things. And that I found, you know, I've, I found it fascinating. You know, it was like, oh, I thought this would work, you know, almost universally. And it was like, no, at a certain point, the abstraction actually begins to interfere with um, possible legibilities and meanings. And so it was almost like, well, it might be interesting to code a lot of things, but to um, leave something more or less um, in its original form or in some approximation thereof. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, maybe it's, a, you know, a result of often, you know, texts in public contexts are, you know, usually meant to be read and to be read quickly and to be absorbed. And this was something that um, additional abstraction did not help. <laughs> you know, it was sort of like, it made it almost like, yeah, illegible. And I did think about, you know, that as an approach, you know, because I am interested in the visible and the non-visible and, you know, those kinds of questions. And I, thought, I, I, I felt like the particular text, the Judith Butler text, was kind of looking at a situation and I thought a very concrete and a very present situation. Mm -hmm. And I began to wonder whether abstraction really helped. You know, maybe at some point I'll release the other version, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that. But yeah, at the time it seemed like, uh, you know, um, too abstract mm -hmm. and too poetic mm -hmm. in a way. Um, it's interesting what you felt that you could have license with sort of deploying this abstraction, right? Like I have a lot to say about what you were just talking about around this kind of move that you were making around um, abstracting the language. And one of the things I thought about was, is immediately Zverino Hurston's, um, it's a quote from her uh, Characteristics of Negro Expression, mm. which is a text I think from 31 or 32, 1931 or 32. And she said, the Negro speaks in hieroglyphs. And when I was looking at that and, and I was immediately said, wow, Tony, first I thought, oh, Tony took the vowels out and I was like yeah. and I thought I had it right until I got to the next one and <laughs> I was like no there's the I and wait I think that's a Y and mm. so every time I tried to create a system like the system only worked for me within one piece maybe mm -hmm. the moment I tried to connect it across to a different piece it failed and I really thought about um how there's a desire around the performance of language that is about its felicity. What I mean by that is the extent to which language is convincing and then the fact that it is convincing that it is satisfying. And given the nature of the kind of material at which you're um, working with, um, these troubling um, realities, right? Life mm -hmm. events, incidents that um, I, I kept thinking, wow, it's almost as though in abstracting the language, you've built in the absolute impossibility of it, right? Like the refusal of um, a satisfaction, mm -hmm. of the refusal of um, its ability to convince. And I was wondering, is this like some kind of materialization uh, that shows us at this time the gaps that exist between what's desired, what's expressed, and how we can't really achieve it at all. There's mm. something really interesting that 
Tony, for me, in terms of like writing about your work and looking at your work for years, that this shift, this turn, took these questions around non-visibility in which you've been so um, invested to some extent and really exploring um, seems to be really amplified. It is though those ideas became monumentalized and, and, and not just about the video, right, right, presentation, but that the very ideas themselves kind of got really foregrounded in the work itself. Thank you. Um... I think, yeah, that question, you know, of scale and how it relates to legibility um, was kind of, I don't know, something I was beginning to try to think through in these pieces. You know, it was like, yeah, I'd done bits and pieces of it before, you know, I titled the show with the kind of breakdown of, you know, things, letters, numbers, you know, symbols. But yeah, it was almost like, um, I was, you know, also thinking, yeah, about questions of, you know, almost representability, you know, it's like these things on one level are kind of troubling um, and traumatic events. And yet, you know, yeah, there is a kind of um, gap between what one might be able to simply say and, you um, the thing that it referred or the event that it refers to. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of wanted to, yeah, get at a certain maybe withdrawal or, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like, well, you can figure it out, right? You know, it's not like, it's not like I can even fully represent it, you know, in, in the plainest language possible, you know, it's, exactly. yeah. And it's interesting because when I was, <laughs> particularly those works where you took a letter letters out, I thought, wow, it's like, Tony is really messing with us because you're trying to read and figure out the words, right? Like you're going through this process of deduction, but then you've got the, the music, right? Like the lyrics, the song there alongside simultaneous to, and so the mind is being asked to do multiple things. That was my viewing here at my computer. Now I imagined driving or walking and doing that. And mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> what is the pressure that is applied given the context in which this work is being shown? I was like, is, is what is um, Tony asking of us? It, it, in a way you put the way that one should be feeling about all of the things that are given to the text in which you're putting forward and that we're trying to deduce, you're actually being made to feel that sense of dissonance and uncertainty and being overwhelmed in a way and um, trying to grasp at something that you can't entirely grasp at, right? At yeah. one time. And I wondered if, if that was, um, were you taking us through our paces, if you will, um, to demonstrate something to ourselves around negotiation, around give and take, around patience and, pop, you know, the inevitability of failure on some level? Um, yeah, in some ways, I, I think those are kind of useful readings, you know, that there is a kind of insufficiency, you know, in these events may have been described um, any number of times in any number of places. And yet there seems that there's always something that, you know, I don't know whether it's above or below um, mm. the mode of representation, but it, it's something that we often still don't, don't quite understand. And I, I don't mean it like in a personal sense, almost like in a cultural sense. Like there's something about these, for instance, violences that we don't really kind of take responsibility for or can't, you know, um, represent. And yet, you know, I, I can also say that there have been some maybe historical shifts in that, which I, you know, also want to acknowledge. But yeah, that there's something that's not not all um, encompassable, 
you know, mm -hmm. even though you you may think you know it or think you understand it or may think you've seen it, it's almost as though it, it's like that problematic where um, people, I think, not that long ago, believed that if you could, you know, present images of horrors being done, that that would produce a certain type of reaction, um, both from the broader society and from the perpetrators, say, of these actions. And now I think that's less, much less secure. It's almost like, yeah, doing evil, mm, can do it, can manage it. You can represent it, but it's always at a distance from the thing that's happening and the thing happens and it happens again. It's almost like, you know, people, I, it's something I'm, I'm, I haven't quite figured out for myself, but you know, the sense of security, for instance, that, that people project and imagine in, you know, the body cam. And it's like, but um, I don't know. It's it, city, right? Yeah, it's like, but then there are all these things. Is it turned on? Oh, it's not turned on. Oh, it's covered over. Oh, it's like, or, you know, someone is doing something um, incommensurably evil. And yeah, there are people witnessing it and photographing it with their cell phones and it doesn't stop it, you know, and people are hollering, stop this. You know, this is, you know, this is insane. This is, you know, or, you know, giving an account of what's happening seems not to have any register, you know, no, it, it's not even a question of, you know, guilt or um, evidence, you know, it's sort of like, it seems to be almost beyond that, you know, it's sort of like, all that's later, you know, something, this thing which is unfolding is happening now. And it's, um, yeah, it's a different now than um, a trial a year later and the verdict from the trial and the way that, you know, the action is represented um, and broken down for um, consumption, legibility, processing. Um, and I think in a strange way, I think maybe a signal piece for me is, is the Elijah McCain, which itself is so fragmented and so, um, Horrifying. Yeah, it's it's not even a question of understanding it. Yeah, Elijah McClain, which is video three excerpts from, um, I believe his comments, his remarks that what he yeah. was saying right before he died as the cops Make were remarks. Yes, as, as him, right. Along. Yeah, but I, I use the term remarks because they are actually so poetic. I mean, yeah. he literally says to them. Oh, but you know, I love you. Um, yeah. I love you all. Um, as they're killing this man, um, a young man, extremely young man. Could you just talk about um, that video? I'd like to talk about them all, um, Tony, but it would be, I'm just curious, like, if you would talk a little bit about your pairing of Elijah's last remarks with the music the sound element and how you kind of thought about that, I guess, across all of these videos, but maybe we could start there. Maybe, yeah, with that one. Um, I, I thought about, it was, it was very, very strange to me. It was sort of like, I, I might've had an initial idea, might have, that mm -hmm. I didn't know what I could do with it or what I could pair with it. And initially I was kind of, not completely stumped. It was almost like, well, I'll try this or I'll think about that. Um, and actually there is an alternative soundtrack to it that has a, a different track with a different, you could say formal economy and a different, almost like positioning in terms of the lyric, who's speaking and um, where they, you know, where they're speaking. In this particular case, I, um, how I found the track was I was aware of this track and it was a, a track that I was interested in because it was not strictly speaking about um, things that pop songs are usually written about. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a, um, a, a particular type of self-assessment with regard to certain failures and 
I don't know, it, it always sort of struck me as, you know, to think about, well, what were, what were those failures? Some people say it's kind of a narration of a um, middle-aged guy, probably a middle-aged white guy, who um, has found himself to be complicit in certain systems and activities. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, doesn't know how quite to resolve it. And I thought that would be an interesting perspective to pair maybe with, because there's something, you know, that oscillates between first person and some other sort of reading in, in that text already, which is one of the things that makes it disquieting. You know, mm -hmm. it's not really a direct evocation of, you know, what an individual is experiencing. As you say, it's like a commentary. And it seems to be um, sometimes like at the level of the body, how that really hurts. But sometimes it's, yeah, saying things about the people that he's interacting with or um, what kind of um, relationship or um, reading or misreading of the situation that he is doing which is, you know, maybe at a, at a different level than, let's say, the body or, um, yeah, what, you know, what's happening, you know, to me. It sort of becomes this other thing. But even, you know, the, the whole, like, the apology and the repeated apology. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, well, what's going on here, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's it, it's disquieting in that way, and so I thought it might be interesting to combine it with something that's maybe not disquieting in the same way, but just a kind of almost like imaginary repositioning of this, you know, almost like from the perspective, mm, not so much of the perpetrator, you know, but it could be, or it could be the witness who sees this horrifying thing and doesn't know what to do with it or how to assess it or, you know, what it is that they're, you know, being asked to attend to. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my, my way of maybe thinking it through. You know, it's as you've, you've heard me say this probably more than once, you know, I, I don't do period soundtracks, you know, or I don't try to line things up so that everything is kind of um, from the same perspective or in the same voice or even in the same time. Um, but it was, it was interesting to think about, you know, what, what time, what other time is there, you know, in, in this particular construction. And so I thought about something that was not, you know, it wasn't a correlative or um, a reinforcement of the text. You know, I, I didn't think about it that way. I mean, I think there, there's a kind of implied relation, you know, um, one could make an argument that it's only, you know, in my head or in the head of certain viewers or readers. And often, you know, you, the only way to find out that, it, that it's not just your um, figuration is to put the things together and see if they resonate and how. Um, and how differentially it may resonate, you know, for others. But yeah. I was really struck by um, the way time has been operating around these sets of issues in your work in, in very um, subtle and yeah. also strident ways. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I was thinking about this question of return and trajectories. It's coming from you talking about this matter of time and. Um, and I was going from like, I'm curious about how you find yourself from the moment of black celebration, right? Um, to uh, this body of work in particular. Mm -hmm. And these, they seem very related to me somehow. And I was wondering um, about this kind of working with language with things that cannot be represented, right? This kind of like, showing up to withhold in a way or letting the mm -hmm. language kind of carry it. That is Lauren Berlant's way of talking about uh, Pope Bell's work, which I find very productive. But this sort of like, how do we pinpoint this sick circuit of repetition around mm -hmm. violence pertaining to 
uh, embody blackness, um, but also to also allow enough um, openness around it so that the interiority, which is so important to surviving the, this uh, world in which fabricates and instigates and um, circulates and guarantees these kinds of events can be survived. And so I'm, I'm curious about how these two and a half minute videos um, register in the matter of minutes, the way like the violence against George Floyd or Elijah McClain or the like seconds that Rihanna Taylor went through that is always somehow anachronistic. It's like of this time and of another time. Mm -hmm. This is a set of conditions that as we know is not new. And that maybe it's even somehow um, quantum time, you know, like mm -hmm. in that it's like, it's not to say that they're interrelated. It's the, it's actually to say that there's an impossibility of their interrelationship mm -hmm. um, because they could never be the same thing. And that somehow the conditions around these incidents, these violences, are seemingly irreversible. For me, that's what makes them quantum, right? It's right. like, wow. it's so totalizing. Um, but I'm just wondering how you find yourself through, um, you know, Evil 27, Selma, Black Celebration to this body of work. I, I think that one of the things that, that compels me is maybe these um, both different sort of times and representations thereof. And I don't know, maybe the, the ways in which they do always for good or ill circle back to the, the both the kind of specificities and the continuities between these kind of traumatic um, actions. Um, I, I remember thinking early in, in my work, like the period around say, Black Celebration and Fade to Black, that I, I, I wanted to take a particular type of maybe, um, I guess it might be related to a kind of um, almost conceptual and proto-modernist take mm -hmm. that it's almost like, I'll do this, I'll try to do this once, but although the conditions continue, I, I can't do it in the same way again. Um, that I kind of have to find a different, um, a different field or, or setting for talking about these things, um, or not, you know, not so much like I couldn't, but more like if this is going to be taken up, someone else probably should do it, and they probably should do it differently. If mm -hmm. I return to this, you know, you could say these scenes or these materials, I have to make a certain attempt to. Um, put a different, put them in a different context or think about them differently or um, represent them differently. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's part of it. You know, it's not like I, I, I would say this is over and therefore I can move on to um, other things. It's more like um, it's not over, but if I'm going to talk about this, I have to um, try to think about it in a, in a, in a different sort of positioning. Um, and so it was almost like, for a bunch of reasons, and I think I may have talked with you about this before, you know, I said, well, archive material is interesting. I've done interesting things with it, but one of the things that it, about it, that, you know, has kind of made it difficult to continue is that what I'm looking for or what I hope to point out is not in the material you know, and that there are certain historical, contextual, and political reasons why um, it won't be represented as such. And it's very interesting, you know, to think about it in a kind of longer um, duration and context, because I think now it is more possible for perspectives, say, of participants in these um, events to be represented. But um, again, I, I feel like that's, a, that's another field and, and others can, can occupy that field. And I, you know, um, I can understand and appreciate, you know, the desire and the necessity to do that. But for some reason I can't, you know, it's like, 
um, I, I kind of have to pursue this, you know, differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not like, oh, that that can't be done. Don't don't bother. It's almost like um, I'm not the person necessarily to do that. And it requires maybe a different, you know, you could say um, approach to making and and basis for that making. Um, but yeah, it's it's almost as though I think there are connections, say, between Evil 27 and Black Celebration. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost in a certain way like it's both a prequel because it looks at a period before. Um, and at the same time, it's, of course, you know, after because, you know, there's a different approach to the question of images and modes and possibilities for representation. So there is a weird kind of also um, play with time and how time is, you know, described. Um, and I don't, you know, it's, I haven't thought through maybe how, why it's different, you know, or exactly how it's different. Um, but I think it has something to do with, you know, those ongoing debates around, you know, should spectacular um, images of trauma be circulated and by whom? Um, at a certain point, it seemed to me that it was interesting to think about, you know, you could say certain, certain limitations or certain impossibilities with regard to um, the existence, the circulation and the framing of you know, certain classes of imagery. I don't know whether I've really answered your question particularly well. I mean, they're just sort of my thoughts about how I get from one, you know, from one thing to another and why, for instance, I, I often do think about like returning to certain classes of imagery, but mm -hmm. I know that I would probably want to treat them differently than they are ordinarily treated. Maybe because, you know, there is an archive of such images and, you know, we have seen them circulated. And so it's almost as though, well, either it's already been done or it can be done and someone else will do it mm -hmm. in my imaginary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I need to do something else. Um, but yeah, it's almost like, can you return to something that is kind of always already returning? And, you know, if you do that, um, from what position do you, you know, attempt to do that? Um, you know, I've probably chosen a particular set of ways, um, but I would not say that they are exclusive. Um, you know, it's just ways. Um, and in some ways, you know, they are, I don't know, trying to address gaps, problems that I've encountered other people may not see those gaps or may, you know, seek to override, you know, those um, histories and problematics. And I, you know, and I congratulate them for doing so. Um, but it's not necessarily what I would do. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, in these works, I'm trying to think about, well, the, the form is also different. Like, um, I mean, I've done short works before, one or two minutes, and usually in kind of commission settings. It's not something I would necessarily do myself, by myself, although often I find it, how, how, should, how should I say it? Expedient, I guess, is the best word. You know, it's like, oh, well, if it's short, then I have, and I have a limited amount of time, something will be done. I'm not, you know, I can make no guarantees, you know, beyond that, but, you know, something will get done. It's two and a half minutes. I have, you know, I don't know, three months to do it. Um, and for me, it was like, I could have just as easily said, um, I will make a 15 minute work and show 30 seconds of it over 30 days. But instead, you know, it was like, I'll make four two and a half minute works that are not really, you know, directly connected to one another. But I do think that there are some thematics that connect them and shifts in scale maybe that connect them. Would you talk about the John Lewis um, piece for, for lack of the specific title in front of me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's like, I don't remember them either. They're, they're abbreviations, you know, often is not. Um, and yeah, I, I refer to them kind of by, by who's speaking almost. Oh, good. Um, it's, it's not a, I don't know, it's not a space for proper names. I, I, I'll have to think about that, why that is. Um, maybe because I, I know that, you know, they're kind of process notes or things that are, you know, related to one another, but I, I don't want to kind of say it's just, it's just a name or it's just the title and the title must be pronounced, you know, each time, every time. It was one of the things that was occupying my mind. Um, I've been, I, I think there are probably some personal reasons for, for it, but I, I don't think that they're necessarily particularly productive or particularly interesting to get into. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess I've become fascinated by um, questions of um, some, somewhere between the testament and the legacy of someone and ways in which, um, people often construct, actively construct um, those, or, you know, if it's almost like, well, if they don't do it, somebody else will do it for them. So it's not like there's an escape and, right. and, and where, you know, you kind of think about it. And I, I think, especially in his case, knowing that he was ill for quite some time and that he continued um, not only to work, but also to kind of um, struggle around the same contents, contexts, and ideas that he had already. So it was hard not to think, you know, in a kind of historic way about him as a figure. And when, you know, I found out, and as many people did, that he had written um, a posthumous um, article to be published by the New York Times, it was kind of like, well, what does that say? And what is, you know, what is that? And how does that relate maybe to um, a more active history? And in my reading of it, and I of course didn't get to use the whole thing, which is something I'd like to redress at some point. Um, one of the things were the continuities that um, you kind of find in, you know, his spoken utterance versus his written and yet they are from two different points in time, they must be. And yet there's this kind of um, continuous kind of circulation around certain problematics. And I think the thing that I found fascinating too is that kind of like you start a text, you know, saying, well, before, you know, I um, pass away, it was very important for me to see something, something in the present that resonates with, you know, um, my past and perhaps my futures. Mm -hmm. And as a gesture, I think I found that to be really compelling. Um, and you paired uh, John Lewis's text with Deadbeat. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> could you talk it, about that a little bit? Kind of, it, was a weird, that? it was a weird kind of happenstance in the sense that I was thinking about and probably would have made a very different choice, um, the text and how it might be. And then it was just uncanny um, that, you know, Scott Monteith, this guy I know, um, have done for, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years. Um, he releases this track and I get this email saying, you know, Dead Beat has released a new track. And it was kind of one of those things of, uh, yeah, okay, Huey Lewis dub. Um, let me, and, and John Lewis is on the cover and merge with uh, Huey helicopter. And I'm like, well, well let, me, let me listen to this and, and think about it. And apparently I haven't really had a long conversation with him about the track, but he did write a short piece about it. Um, and I was like, why does yeah? You know, why does John Lewis appear here, and what is it? You know, what does he say there that relates? You know, to mm -hmm. what he writes, and so it's not something I would normally do, mm -hmm. but I think it. You know, it was the timing and the uncanniness of the timing. It was almost like, well, I'm thinking about this text, 
And then another, you know, text appears with sounds that accompany it that are, um, I mean, I think he has mixed the sound of a helicopter into, and so there's this kind of rhythm, but it's not natural rhythm. And yet, you know, he makes reference to movement and moving, moving our feet, moving our feet. And so there's this weird kind of um, almost, it, it, it seems almost too symmetrical in a way, but then I realize that it's kind of like, yeah, two different moments in time that, you know, sync with one another, you know, mm -hmm. at certain points. And, mm -hmm. you know, the things he's describing are not dissimilar to what he's describing in this last text, but then they are different, you know, and yet they're kind of the same, and it's this sort of play of this, you know, sameness versus difference. Mm -hmm. And like I said, under normal circumstances, I would say, ah, uh, too close, <laughs> you know, um, not not resonant enough, not, you know, um, complex enough. But I thought, hey, it's going to be short. I should try it, you know. Um, and it also, you know, allowed me to reprise the red, the white, and the blue, which... Um, yes, could you talk about your return to the red, white, and blue? <laughs> I, you know, in some ways... It, it, you know, maybe in some weird perverse way, you know, it's like I started working with it almost as a kind of perverse rehearsal of, you know, certain national symbolics. And it was almost like, well, I'm not sure whether I actually agree or believe in any of this, but people, you know, use this and circulate this as though it is meaningful. And so maybe it would be interesting to recontextualize, you know, that as a trope. And, you know, I can't help but think as, as I often do, you know, for me, it's almost like, well, it's complicated because it's the US, but it could be the UK as well. And, you know, you can maybe think about that, that historical series of relationships, special and not mm. so special. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And it was sort of interesting to me, well, I'm doing all these things mostly, but not always about American culture in a British context. And so, I don't know, it always, you know, I'm, I'm always wondering how things, how things will read. And mm -hmm. it's sort of like, I, it's, it's possible to, I don't know, in that particular case to misread things, but I'm, I'm interested too in this whole, you know, phenomena of um, British people like John Lydon eventually coming to live in the United States and, kind of changing his um, identifications politically and culturally because he came to America. There's another fellow that I did a work about that kind of also had the same kind of trajectory. They moved to the States and then they become conservatives when they had not been conservatives when they were in Britain. Um, you know, it's sort of like, it's, it's some, is there something about that movement, you know, or this nation or whatever that produces certain types of cultural and political effects? haven't figured it out, just thinking, you know, just trying to think it through. Or something yeah. that they feel like they want to identify with that finds itself located here on the spectrum of conservatism or something. Yeah, you know? or, you know, I, I think there's also an element, and this is something, you know, people have observed. Um, often immigrants go to a new place to recode themselves and shift their possibilities. And yet one of the strange things that often happens is that they have this desire for the nation that they came from. Mm -hmm. But usually it's a kind of, you know, backward looking. It, it's very strange, you know, mm -hmm. you make a great deal of effort to come to a place that's supposedly, you know, freer and different and, you know, um, organize itself in a different way. And then some strange longing for aspects of the previous hierarchical state make themselves, you know, and it's like, but what is that? Why is that? And I mean, it, it seems to happen, not just, you know, um, British people who moved to the US, but, you know, um, people from South, you know, um, South Asia who moved to the UK, but suddenly become very protective mm -hmm. of their roots in a way mm -hmm. and leads them down very strange, you know, political paths. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, but you no longer live there. Why is it, you know, that you have become so mm. attached to certain aspects mm. of your culture? Mm. You know? um, 
Is this why you decided to work with the John Linden text for the first video? In a way, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's also you know like with me always. There there are always multiple reasons. You know, I mean, one of the reasons was that you know, I, anecdotally, and I think I've told this story a couple of times recently already, but. Um, I did a talk in Manchester, and one of the questions in the Q&A after, someone asked me about the place of anger in my work. And Interesting. one of the first things I thought about, not the only thing, but one of the first things I thought about is, um, and at the time it was like, yeah, he even has done a memoir with this title, um, PIL and, you know, punk rock in general. and anger and, and references there too. And anger, it's kind of a, an attitude and a framing device, you could say. And so, I mean, it was, it was interesting to me, yes, that he embodied all of these, you know, you could say ideas and, you know, in a different context, I guess he came to America and became a Trump fan, ultimately. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, but, I, you know, I, I, I have a kind of double feeling about it. I, I feel almost as though I don't know um, why or how that developed for him personally, but I'm still interested in the relationship, say, between um, anger and discomfort and distaste and um, making work and, you know, thinking about work and thinking about how it should locate itself and comport itself in society. And so I said, I'll return to this because I know there are certain complications and problems there. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm presenting it in a British context and, you know, I'm, I'm doing it in, you know, the cover colors of, um, never mind the bollocks here come the sex pistols. So it's, <laughs> you know, I'm making references to things, but I also know that other things have happened, you know, um, since he wrote that song since he wrote this book, you know, it's it's almost like, and I, I hope those things, you know, kind of reverberate and do come to the surface. Mm. So it's it's not it's not a one way thing. Although it is sort of like I, I thought if I if I open a thing in the UK, I you know should do something that that does some kind of reference. Um, but it's you know it's kind of complicated. And then the Judith Butler text, which is for the last video, video that's the fourth one sure, in yeah. the series, right? Um, could you talk about when, how you came across this text by Butler and how yeah, it sure. this section? Um, I'm, I'm known to collect um, articles, usually these days, you know, not by my own wits, but by, you know, the wits of others via social <laughs> media, people <laughs> post things and it's sort of like, yeah, I'll, I'll read this, you know, or I'll read this later and I, you know, put it in a bin, copy oh, the PDF. Right. And, you know, the question of how to, you know, even talk about the contemporary moment, which is always a kind of vexing and difficult thing to do, you know, keeps coming up. And, you know, people ask me um, what I think. And of course, it's not always about what I think. It's kind of about what other people think. And ways of reading it. Um, and among the articles, you know, that, that discuss this period, this one is probably the most, how should I put it? Um, unlike um, of lies and liars, which seems to frame the antics of Donald Trump and company. Um, I thought it might be interesting to have something that attempts to at least describe and incorporate the multifarious um, difficulties and problems that have become visible, but they were there all the time um, through this pandemic. And so, and again, you know, maybe thinking about a broader public, um, I thought it might be an interesting text to try to present. And then, you know, of course, I made um, a kind of curious soundtrack choice, but one that I don't know. <laughs> I feel like, I was curious. <laughs> For you, Tony. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm always looking for a kind of counterpoint or, you know, something that has a, 
a different sort of context in history to maybe open up um, even something that's recent and contemporary. I mean, one of the things I think in choosing the Joy Division track was, A, it is not one of their best known tracks. B, I keep finding, and this is maybe just a personal thing, I, I have talked to a few people about it who, who get a similar resonance. I, I can't help, speaking of time um, travel, I can't help but finding some resonances between this period and the late 70s to early 80s, which is the same period as um, Joy Division's production. Say it's, more about that. That's very curious. Um, you know, it's it's like what you know what once seemed logical um, no longer you know applies. Um, periods of you know I guess the best word, way to say it is both conservatism and kind of um, trying to squeeze out the last bits of existence of um, the social welfare state. Mm -hmm. All of those things seem to be very much with us now except that you know we're not in the sort of hangover of um nixon um carter to reagan <laughs> it's kind of like well the set's different and it's more extreme but it feels very similar on some strange pathway at least for me mm -hmm. and so it was almost like um you know usually i take the contemporary route in terms of the sound and this time I thought it might be interesting to have something very contemporary and have something historical um, in, in pop culture, that is. Um, and to think about those sort of resonances. Um, you know, some people, I, I think um, one person writing about it said that there is something dystopic um, about, mm -hmm. the, about the soundtrack, which it is in its way. Um, some may find a kind of, um, I guess fatality, you know, or fate in it, mm -hmm. which I'm not sure, you know. I mean, I, I feel like that is something that's kind of made, um, not something that's kind of self-evident. Mm -hmm. But it's a feeling, you know, it's a kind of affective relation mm -hmm. to a time. And yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe some people will say this has nothing, you know, this period has absolutely nothing to do with any past period, you know, that it's very specific, its rhetorics are very specific. But I, I do find this kind of conservative turn, um, not unlike um, that period. Hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. They say that when history repeats, it doesn't just repeat, but in its repetition, it actually intensifies. Right. Coming around. So that would actually maybe help us understand why the rhetoric is so striking. It's familiar and yet its audacity is somehow. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, striking if not shocking. Yeah, and that, you know, um, I don't know, that, that, that brazenness, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, no flinching, <laughs> you know, no guilt. Yeah, yeah. It's like, onward yeah into you know the worst morass of lies that one can imagine is it's like what um yeah i have found myself for the past year running around saying i told you black people are not paranoid <laughs> yeah right yeah we tried to tell you canary in the coal mine uh quite literally um yeah, literally. So, uh i was also curious um Tony, about this shift in the text and music, which seems simpler um, in these works than in other works that you've done. Uh, do you want to talk about that that shift for you? Yeah, I, I can't really say that much about it other than in this case in particular, I think it, it was the awareness that, again, I have to do something mm -hmm. and the temporality is relatively short. So, I could, I suppose, do a sound collage that is as intensive in its way as, you know, the movement from phrase to phrase in, in the text animation. But I didn't get there. You know, what can I say? <laughs> I mean, you yeah, know. Yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, you know, I have all sorts of ideas, you know, too, about ways to, I don't know, return the image, the text, and the sound in, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of intensified, but I, you know, again, I'm not there yet. Well, I'm excited to see. Um, I'd love for you to reflect, Tony, on what it's been like for you to make work in this time. Um, the last almost year has been quite something. I myself have had moments where I couldn't write for the first time in my life. Huh, um, yeah, okay. So that was kind of weird for about three months. And so I'm just very curious when I talk to artists now, I'm very curious about what it's just been like for you um, as someone who has been able to make what, that's, what that process has been like for you. Um, you know, not, not to be um, boring or repetitive, but it has been difficult. You know, it just, it's not like, um, I, I often, yeah, feels kind of suspended between I should be doing more and, you know, what am I doing? You know, I can't, you know, it's sort of like, I can't be doing this right now. Um, and not for, you know, any particular reason, just because, you know, everything's so kind of, um, out of control and it definitely felt, you know, that way, um, almost from the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, all these very strange and, and potentially deadly things are happening. And, you know, <laughs> the leader of our so-called country is, seems to be like in a, diff you know, in a kind of different context where it's going to, you know, it's going to disappear of its own volition mm -hmm. or because, you know, my wishful thoughts, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like, whoa, or simple, um, straightforward, um, science-based things that could be done become, you know, unthinkable and illegal because, you know, I have this fantasy and some people wanting to actually be in that fantasy bubble, mm -hmm. you know, with him. And yeah. it's sort of like, dudes, this is, you know, this is, this is kind of a formula for disaster. But yeah, a lot of, you know, at least in government, um, which he had, you know, seated and set up, you know, we're kind of, yeah, this is the way to do it. And, you know, you know, I'll get the disease and I'll beat it, you know, and it's sort of like, yeah, but that's not, you know, it's everybody isn't going to go out that way, you mm -hmm. know, um, and for all sorts of reasons. Um, but yeah, to kind of have that as the kind of, you know, constant, um, you know, it's like, wow, deeply, deeply irrational and deeply, you know, um, frightening. Yeah. And so, I don't know, you know, often for me, I'm, I'm not really a super complex person. Um, you know, doing something else is kind of um, one way to avoid the, you know, absolute sort of terror and paralysis, I guess. Um, but sometimes it's more, more effective than others. And, you know, I do sort of say, wow, this is what I've done during, <laughs> you know, it's like, it just seems, yeah. Um, I love that you use the word fantasy because I saw somewhere earlier today that Rosalind Krauss had actually sent a letter to the editor <laughs> of the New York <laughs> Times. Did you see that? Yes, I did. And she was I like, did. correction. Yeah, not this is a big not correction. <laughs> the big <laughs> correction is this is a, you know, this, this has no. <laughs> it's not a conspiracy theory. This not a conspiracy, conspiracy theory. fantasy. fantasy. It's not a theory, it's right? Really, really a theory well may done. have them based in observation and in ideas. This is a fantasy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's, it's kind of, it, it's one thing, you know, to have people embrace a rhetorical um, mm -hmm. modality and say, well, I don't know whether it's true, but it feels true, you know, or I wish this to be true. It's, it's another for it to be a total fabrication, yeah. you know, with no, you know, it's like, it's not, you know, it's sort of like, this is not a cure for a disease. Right. It is not, you know, um, it, it's not even, yeah, in that sense, it doesn't even qualify, you know, as a theory. It's, it's a fantasy. I love that shade. That was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, always a pleasure. Indeed. This was great. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. The work looks fantastic.
Thank you. And I cannot wait for you to build on it. Um, you do. Yeah. I'm always, you know, want to know what's happening next. So. Of course. Of course. Take good care. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank You're you for welcome. taking the time. I really appreciate it. Of course. Bye. Anything for you, Tony. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye. Sir Content First, a very important platform. And it's really just asking uh, us to pause in this moment. Art can be a form of disruption when it appears on such a uh, exposed place as the, the Piccadilly advertising screen. can only be important if it supports your community. See Your Name in Lights is our fundraising initiative to challenge this model of only having kind of, you know, rich 1% funding and supporting the arts.